All right, and now we are recording. So on that note, hi everybody. My name is Janelle Ware. I am the horticulture educator with Extension for Marathon and Wood Counties. I um, wanted to say thank you for taking some time with me this evening. I know the weather is beautiful. And so I especially appreciate you taking a little bit of time to, to uh, learn a little bit about gardening this evening. So on that note, why don't we jump in? Because I've got a lot of stuff to share with you. And let me just get my screen set up. All right. It'll just take me one moment. And let me try one more thing real quick. All right. Um, one more check. Um, so if somebody could just uh, put inside the chat if you see a red screen right now. Just want to make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Perfect. Okay, so this is session two of Romaine Calm and Garden On. Tonight we're going to be talking about taking a mapping plan. So a mapping, or I'm sorry, a planting plan. So a planting plan is kind of just right when you write down uh, um, all the different uh, plants that you want to grow in your garden. And we're going to take that kind of uh, uh, chart and we're going to map it out. We're going to figure out where you're going to put your plants inside the garden. So we're going to start off talking about crop rotation, and then we will get into the actual mapping. All right. So before we get started, um, wondering, and this is one of those times where you can go ahead and unmute yourself, or you could drop it in the chat, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Um, does anybody, first of all, does anybody keep a garden journal? And if you do keep a garden journal, um, what kind of information do you keep in there? What do you record? And um, how do you use this information? If you don't currently keep a garden journal, why do you think that would be important? Why do you think some people would want to keep a garden journal? Go ahead and answer, either in the chat or mute yourself. Any thoughts? Well, I'll tell you what I think of right away when I think about um, when I think about uh, garden journals is, you know, you want to keep track of what went right and what went wrong. Right. So you may want to put down things like, I don't know, let's say you're growing cucumbers and you had some powdery mildew. You might want to write down when you first got that powdery mildew. So that way next year you'll know, you know, it'll give you some clues of when this particular disease showed up or when that particular um, uh, insect pest happened. Might also help you to know maybe how long different seeds took to germinate, things like that. Um, so inside of your handout that I gave you, one of the um, uh, other resources or uh, additional like links and resources. There's one that's called um, NC State Garden Journal article. It's going to be in the, the very beginning of the handout that I gave you. Um, and on that NC State Garden Journal article, they talk a lot about different ways that you can use your garden journal and some different um, record keeping, uh, just kind of things to kind of keep in mind in that regard. All right, so now that we're all kind of thinking about, you know, keeping records and how could how we might keep records, let's go ahead and jump into crop rotation. So one thing I want you to keep in mind or do is think about it's really important to organize your crops into plant families. So what do I mean by plant families, right? Um, well, plants just like all. all well, plants can be organized or categorized all sorts of different ways, right? And one of the ways that we can do that is um, by genetics, by plant families. So the reason why we would want to do that is um, genetically similar plants 
often we'll have either insects or diseases or um, nutrient demands that are uh, in common with each other. So we can think about this like with people, right? So in my family, on my father's side of the family, type two diabetes really runs thick. Um, and so because of that, because I'm susceptible of that, I get my glucose tested every year. So that way I can keep an, an eye on that. Same thing with plant families. So um, plants that are genetically related, they often have similar um, diseases or insects that like to eat them will be in common too. And then that nutrient load, um, how much of either nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. So those are the big three, your macronutrients. Um, but there's also, I think like 13 other micronutrients so things like copper or boron. Um, different plants are gonna need that, that uh, whole suite of different types of nutrients, but they're gonna take them up at different rates depending on each plants or each species is needs, right? Each cultivar's needs. Um, and so since there's different rates of needs that are being pulled up out of the soil, if we rotate our plants, we can kind of balance out that nutrient loss that we have. Let me just check my notes real quick. Um, so if let's say that I've got a spot in the garden that I really love to uh, grow my cucumbers, you know, year in, year out, and I just keep growing them in that same spot, I may find that after a couple of years, maybe one or two years, I'll notice all of a sudden I've got cucumber beetles, right? And, um, you know, that first year might not be too much of a big deal. But year two, year three, three, year four, those insects over winter, and they will actually um, increase over time. So I might not have had a problem with my yields that first year, but after five years, they may be in such great numbers that they're devastating my um, cucumber crop, okay? So um, we want to avoid having either an insect or a disease or even nutrient loss. You know, you keep growing corn in the same spot over, over and over again. And I'll be picking on corn a couple of times throughout this uh, presentation. Um, but, you know, corn is a, what the, we like to affectionately call a heavy feeder, it pulls up a lot of nitrogen. So if you're constantly growing corn in the same spot, you're going to really need to replenish with a lot of corn. But if you rotated it out with say a legume like beans and peas, you can help reduce how much of that nutrient loss is happening over time. So here I've got our eight plant families, um, typical kind of garden plants. This isn't representative of all the different types of vegetable plants that you could grow in your garden, but these are the big ones, okay? So I thought these would be the most important to kind of at least familiarize yourself with this concept. These charts exist. You'll have, you've got a copy of this chart inside of your notes, so you don't feel like you need to necessarily um, commit everything to memory. It's more of just being familiar with the concept and knowing where to find the information later on, okay? So let's start with the pea family. The pea family, I'm talking about legumes. So that's your dry beans, as well as your green beans and all of your peas, your snow peas, your sugar snap peas and your garden shelling peas. Um, next, we've got our mustard family. That's a big family. That's gonna be your cabbage, broccoli, your turnips, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, kale, mustard greens, all of those are all uh, very, very closely related. In fact, I think they're all, at least most of them should be the same species, believe it or not. They just, how they grow, um, they express themselves a little bit different. Next, we got our goosefoot family. You can call that the spinach family or their, um, the beet family. Uh, the other thing that grows in that group is going to be your Swiss chard. Over here, we've got our carrot family. That carrot family is uh, going to include parsnips, um, but it also includes parsley and celery. So all of those you want to kind of group together. The curcubits over here, the gourd family, that's another decent sized family. And that's going to include your pumpkins, your melons, summer and winter squashes, as well as your cucumbers. Really, if it vines, more than likely it's going to be inside your curcubits. Okay, the other one that vines that comes to mind for me is going to be the nightshade family over here, and that's going to be your tomatoes. 
but we'll get we'll get to that next or we'll get to that last. Next, we've got our sunflower family. Sunflower family is going to include your lettuce as well as your endive. And then we've got our onions. Onions include things like garlic and leeks and shallots. Um, your regular like like a regular onion, as well as bunching onions. So scallions are also included in that group. And then finally, this is probably my favorite family, the nightshade family. That's going to be your tomatoes, your tomatillos, your brown cherries, eggplants, potatoes, as well as peppers, both chili peppers and bells. Okay, so if you rotate the location of your crops, by families each year, you can reduce the number of, uh, that the total number of insects, diseases, as well as that nutrient loss, you can reduce the effects of all of those um, just by uh, rotating your crops. So one thing I kind of want to introduce to you is um, pest management, okay? Now in pest management, um, and I, it, this is in this session, session two, I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about it. But as we progress through the series, we really take a much more deeper dive into pest management. So if uh, pests have been, pest diseases, anything along those lines have been a, a confusing or an issue for you, stick with the series. Um, we start into pest management in session six. But for tonight, I just want to introduce the idea that there's different types of cultural or different types of control methods for any types of pests. Those are going to be either cultural. Cultural just means how you grow the plant, right? So um, different ways that we grow plants can help reduce uh, those diseases and insects. Um, crop rotation, it would be would fall under that cultural method. All right. Another cultural method might be growing your um, your uh, curcubits, your coal crops, so like your cabbage and your cauliflower, growing those underneath um, floating row covers, um, at, at least up until it's time, they fl uh, flower up until it's time for pollination, um, uh, will help, help protect them from certain types of insects, right? So how you grow your plant, that's a cultural method. Next, we've got mechanical method. Mechanical method really just refers to, um, you know, if we're using tools or if we're using our hands. So just out there picking the bugs off. Biological methods uh, are ways that we use, in, or I'm sorry, organisms, beneficial organisms to kind of help you know, protect our plants or help our plants in one way or another. And then there's chemical. Chemical, I'm really just talking about sprays. This is both going to include your uh, organics as well as your synthetic chemicals, okay? Um, we want to save the chemicals for the last, all right? That's not to say that we don't use chemicals, but we've got this whole, whole uh, uh, toolkit of all of these other control methods. And so we wanna make sure that we're utilizing all of them. Um, so uh, this is a uh, crop, uh, crop rotation is a cultural control method. Um, and the reason why we're doing that again is because over time, those insect or pathogen numbers can build up in an area. And after a while, you'll probably find some reduction to your yield. You're not going to grow as much. You're not going to get as many uh, vegetables out of your garden because the insects and the diseases can build up. In fact, this middle picture right here, this club root, that is on some sort of um, somebody in the mustard family, one of our coal crops. I can't tell by the roots which one, but going to be something like cauliflower or Brussels sprouts or something like that. So club root, it's a disease, it's soil-borne disease. And what happens is once you've got enough club root in your soil that it's um, actually affecting your roots like this, what happens is it starts by affecting the roots, but the plant itself really doesn't uh, thrive. It um, doesn't uh, reach maturity like it should, okay? Um, what happens is once you've got club root in your soil, it's going to stay there, regardless of if you're growing uh, curcubits or not. It has the potential to stay there at least 10 years and maybe even significantly longer. Club root can be avoided, or hopefully most of the time it can be avoided by practicing good crop rotation. If you're practicing good crop rotation, the club root doesn't have enough time to take root in your soil, okay? 
Um, I mentioned the nutrient, uh, nutrient um, the, the differences that plants take up in different types of nutrients. All right here, this last picture over here, this is a, um, one of our uh, coal crops, kind of looks like a cauliflower to me, just because of how round the leaves are, but I'm not positive about that. It could be Brussels sprouts too. Um, this guy is suffering from uh, nitrogen deficiency, and you can tell because the coloring isn't quite what it should be. And then over here, I've got a picture of uh, cutworms. Um, and so cutworms can build up in your garden area over time too. And if we don't supply the, the cut, uh, cutworms with this, uh, a, a steady supply of food year in and year out, they're not going, they're going to be less likely to hang out. All right. So um, hopefully you all are ready to play a little game with me. I'm going to put a uh, type of crop on the screen. Go ahead and either unmute, unmute yourself and um, guess what family it belongs in, or you can drop it inside the chat. I'm going to start off with tomato. What plant family do you think tomatoes belong in? I got one vote for nightshade. Any other votes? Any other thoughts, guesses? There you go. Oh, we got several votes for nightshade. Let's see. Just make sure. Looks like we got a lot of nightshade. All right, let's see. Let's see. That's correct. All right, let's try another one. Brussels sprouts. What family does Brussels sprouts belong to? Any guesses? Got two votes for mustard. Anybody else want to guess? All right, I'm going to go ahead and do the big reveal. It was the mustard family. Nice job. Let's try another. How about pumpkin? What family does the pumpkin belong to? Got one vote for Gord. Two votes, three votes for Gord. All right. Give her a shot. Let's see. Nice job. Oh, this time we got spinach. This one could be tricky. Which family do you think spinach belongs to? Got one foot, one vote for goosefoot, two for goosefoot. Hmm. Any other votes? Any other brave souls want to try to take a stab at it? All right, let's do it. Ah, Nikki was thinking sunflower, but nope, it's actually goosefoot. Goosefoot, yeah. And this is one, that's why I said it could be tricky. This one can kind of get you. All right, let's try another one. Lettuce. family does lettuce belong to? Got two votes for sunflower. All right, we'll check it out. It was sunflower. Nice job. Nice job. And remember, right now, you don't need to memorize these. Um, they'll come they will be, if they're not already second nature to you, they will become second nature to you. But for right now, just um, familiarize yourself with the concept. Just kind of be thinking about them. Oh, you know, once I'm kind of figuring out where my plants are going to go, I'm going to want to double check those plant families. Okay, so um, it's going to be easier for you to keep track 
of where, you know, because if you'd want to do crop rotation, you could do it, you know, just very much like a Jackson Pollock painting, right? You could have your tomatoes over here and you could have your peppers over here and you could have your uh, uh, kale here and your Brussels sprouts here, you know, you could kind of go all over the place, but that's going to get real confusing by the time you're, you know, a couple years into your garden, right? So it's probably going to be easiest for you if you group your plants by plant families, all right? Um, so how would we do that? What does that look like in practice? Well, let's pretend like we, that could be either I have three raised beds, or maybe I've got uh, one single garden, but I've kind of uh, sectioned it out into three different sections, okay? Um, so year number one, in that first part of the garden, I'm going to put all of my tomato uh, family plants, okay? So I'm going to put my tomatoes and my eggplants and my chili peppers right there. In bed two, this is where my cold crops are going to be. So I'll have my uh, broccoli and my kale and my Brussels sprouts. In that last bed, I'm going to put my watermelon and my pumpkins in, okay? Now, Ah, Hannah's asking, would this pertain to container gardening? Great question. Um, so if you didn't have a um, couple of thoughts for you, you know, what I'm really, really thinking about here is that um, uh, uh, like um, um, diseases and insects staying in the soil. And so I'm not too worried about your container plants because for, number one, container plants are a lot easier to maintain when it comes to uh, protecting them from diseases and pests. Um, containers require you to just be paying attention to them a lot more closely. Containers are gonna require being watered on a uh, daily basis, sometimes even twice daily. Um, so not so much, mo the, the crop rotation is not so much going to be as important. Um, I guess the biggest piece for me would be, uh, if you can reuse your soil inside of your containers from year, from one year to the next, as long as you didn't have any pest or disease issues, okay? So if you had some major insect or disease issues, I would suggest uh, uh, starting with fresh soil. If you didn't have any of those, then you don't need to start with fresh soil. So not necessarily crop rotation. You can keep growing the plants in the same container, um, but you definitely are going to be needing to follow up with a, a fertilization plan, some sort of um, uh, fertilizer that you're adding to those containers. Um, and then just keeping an eye and making sure that you're not having any issues over your season. All right, in year two, I'm going to rotate where everything's at, I'm moving everybody down one. So the watermelon, all of those vining vegetables are going to come back up to bed one. Uh, tomatoes, you guys are moving down into bed two. And then the broccoli and our Brussels sprouts and our kale is going to move over to bed three. And I'm writing down where everybody is inside my garden journal. All right, so now we've got year three. Our broccoli has moved from bed three all the way up to bed one, and then everybody else just shifts down one, right? So our vining vegetables, watermelon, squash, cucumbers, they're all going to move down one. Um, tomatoes, anybody in that nightshade family is going to move down one. Now, let's, let's pretend like last year in this bed, I only grew broccoli, right? Well, when I move this over here, I'm not too worried about it. I'm not too worried about the specific crops that I grew last year. I would want to, let's say I want to grow Brussels sprouts instead of broccoli. I'm going to put the Brussels sprouts in that same um, area where I had um, anybody else that was in its family the year before. Okay. So you can swap out, say I'm growing tomatoes here this year. I want to grow chili peppers next year. I'm gonna grow chili peppers in this spot, okay? So you're kind of keeping in mind, chunking them together by families. Okay, chat time. So all of this is crop rotation, is keeping track of everybody and kind of grouping families together. This is all because this is one way for us to reduce um, 
insects, reduce diseases, um, reduce other types of pests, and also to kind of even out that nutrient depletion in our soil. Well, let's pretend like um, uh, we've got a very small four by four foot uh, garden, or let's take Hannah's example, and we're growing in containers, right? So um, we're in a situation where crop rotation just is not going to be feasible for us, okay? What are some other things that we could do that are going to uh, have some of those same effects? Preventing disease, um, reducing pests, or reducing nutrient depletion in our soil. Any ideas? And you could drop it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Plant a different family of crops each year. I like that answer. That's a great answer. Yeah, so maybe maybe one year um, in my four by four foot garden, I am growing um, tomatoes. And the next year I use that space for bush beans. Yeah, I love that idea. I love that idea. Rotate in four areas. Um, so do you mean like uh, by having like uh, within your little four by four foot um, space? Is that, um, if you're that tight, I don't know how effective it's going to be. But if you've got four different beds, definitely. So so Hannah says uh, she's heard removing diseased leaves right away and keep pots further away from each other to prevent the spread uh, from one plant to the next. Love that answer. Absolutely. Proper plant spacing, whether they're in the ground growing next to each other or in containers. Either way, you want to make sure that you've got plenty of space. Um, if, a, if we're talking about foliar diseases, if they're growing so that way the leaves are touching each other, what you can end up happening is um, disease starts over on plant number A, and it's going to end up sharing it with the plant B, the plant that it's touching. Another thought for you is sometimes diseases are spread from one plant to the next by insects. Um, and I want you to keep in mind, insects don't brush their teeth in between plants. And so if you've got your plants kind of growing on top of each other, um, they are going to end up sharing. Um, if, and if an insect, sometimes insects will have um, uh, either like a bacteria or maybe a virus or sometimes even fungus, they'll have those on them, maybe, um, you know, like inside their mouths or, or wherever they have however they share the diseases from one plant to another. But by doing this, that insect may be your, your vector, that might be that bridge. So having some good plant spacing might help prevent some of that from happening. So really big thing I wanted to met, kind of get us thinking about is, is crop rotation isn't the end all of, um, of uh, pest management, but it's definitely a significant uh, piece to add to your toolbox if you can. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about mapping out our garden. So the first thing you want to do is you want to kind of think about where you're planning on putting your garden, okay? And go ahead and just draw a really rough sketch. This doesn't have to be, you know, very precise at all. You want it to be accurate, but it doesn't need to be very precise. Nice rough sketch. You want to first identify where is the water. And then also be thinking about, you know, how do you plan on utilizing the water? Is the water convenient? Okay. Do you plan on using rain barrels? Are you going to use a hose and a watering wand? Are you going to be using sprinklers? How are you going to get that water to the plants? Okay. Um, next, you want to locate any structures. Um, so here in this picture, I've got a fence that's on the west side of my garden. Okay, so this actually is a little rough sketch of where I've got my little garden bed um, on the side of my house. And I do have a fence 
right over here on the western side. And so I made a little note for myself that fence might block out the late afternoon sun. That could potentially be important for me to know when I'm mapping out my garden that, you know, if I have some really plants that really, really need a lot of light, I may not want to put them here. I might want to put them further over on this end of the garden because this end of the garden doesn't get blocked by sun. Okay. Another thing you want to make note of is any trees and shrubs. And you'll notice over here, I've got some shrubs on the northeast side of my garden. Shouldn't block any, it shouldn't be an issue for blocking any light, right? But it could potentially compete for resources. Big resources I'm thinking about is um, not the sun because it's on the north side, but it could uh, compete for moisture, water, and it could also compete for nutrients, okay? So um, I've got a real, not so much in this spot, the shrubs don't, don't have that much of an effect, but in my backyard, I've got a very, very shady, I live in town, um, I've got a very, very shady uh, lot, and so it really, really, really has to rain a lot because um, I've got some really, really old established trees, and they suck all of the moisture out of my yard, um, really has to, and I live, I live down in Stevens Point, so there's a lot of sand in this area. So between how well it drains and just the size of the trees, they pull all of that moisture right out of the soil. So keep in mind, even if the shrubs are or the trees aren't competing for sunlight, they might be competing for water or nutrients. Make sure you're marking the direction um, of your garden. It's going to help you with determining whether or not anything is going to be blocking that sunlight for you. Okay. And then, um, oh, you're going to want to take some notes of the dimensions of your garden space. All right. So mine's a four by eight. Um, I didn't write it down. Probably should have. Okay. So you want to map out your garden space with those specific crops and cultivars that you're planning on growing, all right? Um, so if possible, use graph paper. It's gonna make your life easier. In the notes, I uh, included a little PDF of printable graph paper. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, you know, you can always map something else with, map something out without the graph paper. But I find, especially um, if you're doing intensive gardening, like square foot gardening, um, it will really help you keep track of how many plants you're going to be putting in each space. So, First thing you want to do is outline your beds and make sure you make a mark of the path that you plan on using. All right. So in our next session, we're going to take a deep dive into soil and we're going to learn about soil compaction and why soil compaction is the enemy of the gardener. But just for now, keep in mind um, this little phrase, permanent paths permanent beds. You don't want to be walking where your plants are going to be growing. It's going to compact the soil and it's going to make it so that way there's not as much room for water or air to be down in that soil. So mark up space for where your path is going to be and really try not to be walking in the place where you're planning on planting your garden. Okay. So you've marked out where the beds are going to be. You've marked out your, your walking path. Um, next thing you want to do is figure out kind of where are those places where the plant families are going to go, okay? Um, and then you're going to be utilizing that sketch that you made right here. That's going to let you know where to put the, um, where to put the sun-loving plants and making sure that the sun-loving plants are going to not get shaded out. Um, if you have any structures or any, any sort of shade issues. Um, and then in the link, or I'm sorry, in the handout, um, I, in fact, let me just share this with you really quick. Let me pop this over here. So this is the handout that I've been talking about. I've been kind of, it's literally my notes. So, um, you know, if there's, if we, you, finish the program tonight and you're thinking to yourself, oh gosh, what was it that she was talking about, about, you know, whatever, it's all of my notes are right here. So in the session one handout, we're gonna click on that link. 
just in case you weren't with us, you've got that link and you have that information. And the session one handout, if we scroll down, you're going to find this planting guide for central Wisconsin gardens. Um, this, I, I combined a couple of different extension resources. The thing I want to point out right now for you is um, the, the spacing between plants and footprints in inches. So if you're doing traditional like in the ground row planting, you've got lots of space. Um, this will tell you, generally speaking, how much space you need to be leaving in between your plants. And then if you're doing like a square foot gardening, this is gonna give you a better idea of how much space plants are gonna take up. All right, so definitely utilize this when you are working on your, um, when you're working on your, um, your map. And, all right. Okay. So crops that are too close to each other compete for re can compete for resources, encourage diseases, and share insect pests. I've kind of gone over this a few times now, so I'm just going to double check that there isn't anything that. Um, I haven't already gone over. Okay, yeah, I think I've already shared all that information with you. Um, next piece I wanted to mention was, um, you wanna make sure that you're planting your taller crops in the back of the garden. Ideally, this would be the north side of the garden, okay? So, and I can kind of tell just by where the, um, where the, the light is dancing off of the plants and where the shadows are. This is the south side of the garden and this is our north side of the garden, okay? Now you can imagine if they would have planted these tomatoes back here, these tomatoes are just growing, growing, growing. They're gonna reach all the way up as far as they can until the frost comes. Um, if we would have put these tomatoes over in the front of the garden, all of this back here, it wouldn't get that much sun. It would be totally shaded out, right? So be aware of how tall your plants are gonna grow and um, make sure that you're putting that, the, the tall stuff to the back. Although you may find that some of your plants, your leafy plants especially, so maybe herbs or uh, lettuce or um, spinach, they might prefer to be on that north side of these tomatoes. They like a little bit more uh, shade. Um, so that might be another thing to kind of keep in mind. Ooh, let's go back. Okay, the last big thing I wanted to kind of um, uh, um, hopefully inspire you is to think about gardening in terms of not just one growing season, but three growing seasons, okay? Um, and I'm speaking more for like upper mid, uh, upper Great Lakes area. Um, so I'm in central Wisconsin, but if you are in say Florida, where I grew up, um, actually in Florida, you would still want to be planting because you've, you've got the opposite issue. We've got cold down in the South, they've got extreme heat. Um, so just, I guess, basically keeping in mind, because I'm not sure where everybody's at in, in this uh, program tonight, keeping in mind um, all of your opportunities to grow and being aware that there's cool season crops and there's warm season crops, right? And so um, those cool season crops, we can grow them in the spring. And then we could also do a second planting in midsummer. So that way we can harvest them in the fall. Those cool season crops, they are, we call them cool season because they don't mind if they get kissed by the frost. Now, that doesn't mean that they necessarily love, you know, long deep freezes. Not all of them can tolerate that, but they can tolerate just, you know, some mild frosts that come through in the springtime. Um, so take advantage of those cool season crops and make sure that you're uh, planting for that spring season as well as that fall season. That way you're gonna get the most bang for your buck in your plants or in your garden. Okay, so 
here I've got a spring garden mapped out and I've got a summer garden mapped out. Let's take a look at, you know, what we've got going on here. So over in this green bed in the spring, we're planting a lot of lettuce plants. So it looks like I've got some red leaf cabbage, some romaine lettuce, and iceberg, and um, I don't know, I think it kind of looks like maybe an oak leaf oak leaf lettuce, an old heirloom variety. Um, in the orange bed over here, we've got our cold crops. Um, so I've got some broccoli and some Brussels sprouts. And over here, I've got these spring radishes, right? I got a bok choy and a red cabbage, and I've got these spring radishes. Fabulous thing about spring radishes is um, they only take, well, not all of them, but some of them, you can get them where there are days to harvest from planting a seed or at least from germination until um, time to harvest, it's as short as 25 days. So radishes can be a real fun thing to kind of sneak into the garden in the spring. Um, here, I've left some space for where I'm eventually gonna be putting in pole beans. But until then, until that ground's warm enough, I'm gonna be growing my spring peas over here. And in this last bed, I've got some cover crops protecting my soil. So cover crops are awesome because they're going to make it so that way no weeds are going to grow in this space until I'm ready to plant it. And then I'm going to turn over that cover crop and I'm going to let it sit for about two weeks or so. And then that's going to add just a little bit of a nitrogen boost for my garden plants. So that was my spring garden. In the summertime, I've replaced all those lettuce, lettuce plants with my warm, loving tomato family plants. Um, continuing growing my uh, curky bits over, not my curky bits, sorry, my cold crops over here um, and replacing those spring radishes with a couple of different, uh, different, I've got, what is that, red cabbage and bok choy. Over where my legumes were, I've added my pole beans, my spring peas, they don't like the heat. They're just gonna kind of um, peter out once those temperatures get warm. So I can replace them with bush beans. And then over here where I had the cover crops before, once those soil temperatures are nice and warm, I can put in those vining vegetables that really, really need nice warm soil temperatures. So summer's gone, coming along, things are growing greatly, I still have the same plants in the same spot, but now we're moving, I'm kind of thinking ahead for fall. So maybe I had some determinant tomatoes here that are finished for the season. I could go ahead and maybe replace those with bunching onions because bunching onions don't take that long to grow. Um, and bunching onions is just another word for scallions. Um, and then maybe I, I've replaced my chili peppers with some garlic because fall is a great time to plant garlic. Um, here, maybe I've, these guys down here were all finished. And so maybe I planted this up with a, um, a uh, real short, um, like maybe 50 day kohlrabi. Um, and then I had to sneak these in here, winter radishes. So these are, um, I think they're called Spanish winter radishes. If you have never seen them, I just, I adore them. I think they're absolutely beautiful. The, the outside has this beautiful, very matte black color to them. And then when you slice them, it's the most glorious white, just like a very crisp, like snow white color on the inside. They make fantastic roasting vegetables in the fall. Over here, my pole beans are still rocking, but my bush beans, bush beans have a way of just kind of producing all at once and then being done. So maybe when they were all finished, I replaced them with my carrots, or maybe this is a combination of carrots and parsnips. And then over here, I've got my, um, my vining vegetables, my curky bits, and they're still finishing out the season. All right, so oh, that's pretty much everything that I had to share with you this evening. I've got two more things I want to share. First of all is a demographics poll and next is going to, and then after that it'll be an evaluation poll. While we're going through those two things, if you have any takeaways from tonight, any sort of like, aha, I had no idea, um, you know, I'm going to use that going forward go ahead and either unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. Otherwise, what's clear is mud. Um, what, what's still confusing? If you've got some questions and are hoping, you know, maybe some clarification, you can drop that in the chat or mute, unmute yourself too. Um, 
just wanted to finish this off with my email address. If you got the email with the link, you've got my email address, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions horticulturally related. That could include, you know, right now, like later on tonight, question comes to mind, but also later on in the growing season or even all the way into winter time, you know, let's say Christmas comes along and you've got a poinsettia and you don't know what to do with it. You've got my email address. So you can definitely reach out to me. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.